I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along. We've been having uh, great conversations about issues that matter in our community. Today is no exception. I want you to meet Gilbert Acevedo. He's been appointed to the Assistant Commissioner for the Health Systems Bureau at Minnesota Department of Health since October 15th, I think. He's responsible for overseeing the Health Policy Division Health Partnership Division, and Health Regulation Division of the Office of Medical Cannabis. But today, Gil, I'd like to you to address the question that's been in the news lately of elder abuse. Mm. Uh, Minnesota has been um, sort of looking at itself differently right. and revealing that we are not taking the best care of our elders. Uh, tell me about the condition that your department is discovering and what the department is trying to recommend as policies and practices to support and protect elders. Yeah, so Al, thank you very much for uh, inviting, uh, inviting me to come out and talk about this. It is an important topic. Um, it's something that is the center point right now of a lot of the work that we're doing here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Governor Mark Dayton has placed this as a high priority for the Minnesota Department of Health and has appointed our commissioner, Commissioner uh, Jan Malcolm, and we are in partnership with the Department of Human Services with uh, Commissioner uh, Piper as well, Emily Piper. Um, this is a topic that I wish we weren't talking mm. about. Mm. You know, this is something that uh, has been in the news nationally. Uh, we have, as people are aging, um, the baby boomers are hitting an age where they're needing some assistance and some help. And what we're finding ourselves in a situation where we're, we have individuals or people that are, are helping their loved ones, placing them in nursing homes, assisted living, home care, needing some assistance. And what we're finding is that um, they're being abused uh, in, in various ways, uh, sexual um, assault of elderly. Um, we're finding financial exploitation where um, they're, they're, all of their property is you know being uh, taken or in some cases uh, their medication, so drug diversion. Mm -hmm. And so the Minnesota Department of Health has an area of regulatory that I oversee and it's called the Office of Health Facilities Complaint. Mm -hmm. And the Office of Health Facilities Complaint is responsible for uh, responding to complaints. And according to Minnesota law, we are required to, within the first five days of receiving that, that complaint, is go out and investigate these complaints. We triage it. It comes in through an intake. Uh, we receive it. We triage it. And then uh, we make a assignment of either on-site investigation or we do an in-house investigation. Um, we have failed in that. Uh, we have found ourselves where instead of uh, by law, we were supposed to resolve these complaints within 60 days. And it has been taking eight months, eight to nine months, in some cases over a year to uh, investigate the complaint. And meanwhile, we have individuals that are, uh, and family members that are not receiving information follow-up. Uh, they're not hearing about the, the uh, resolution of the complaint. And again, in some cases, the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator continues to work in this environment. And so, um, as I said, in uh, the, the you know, Governor Dayton has really made this a high priority for us. And so we are having a, a very specific focus in this area. So I'll give an example. So we, uh, in December um, into January, we had 2,300 um, complaints that were in our intake and, and uh, triage that were sitting there, 2,300. We haven't, th that we, we hadn't even looked at to assign for investigation or anything. Uh, as of yesterday, we've cleared that backlog. So, so uh, the 2,300 cases that we were looking at, we've actually 
gone through them and made an assignment of either on-site investigation, needing more information, or we've actually uh, closed them. Anymore. So they're not sitting in queue anymore. Mm -hmm. And so um, why is this important? Because as we all age, we want to be able to have a peace of mind mm -hmm. that as we uh, seek assistance in, in nursing homes or assisted living, and we place our loved ones in these areas, that when you, when you walk away, you want to make sure they're safe, mm -hmm. that they're living a dignified uh, a life in these areas. What, now, are you, what are you finding as reasons so far? Is it a question of uh, lack of oversight, lack of staffing uh, to manage the complaints, or is it a lack of uh, staffing to actually provide the services mm -hmm. and therefore people are able to uh, do less than expected, less than acceptable uh, service or outright deception, right? Okay. You described that. Right. W what is the uh, assessment at this moment? So I, I guess let me clarify a couple things. So there are processes to do background checks mm -hmm. on individuals when they start to work. Um, and, the, and the state went from uh, a, a little over a hundred different numbers and county where the, they would call the county if they had a complaint or a concern to a common entry point. And so the common entry point is a single point of uh, contact, one telephone number, you call in if you have a complaint and that's called the Minnesota Adult Abuse uh, Reporting Center. Mm -hmm. um, I think a number of things happen. It's almost like, uh, sad to say, a perfect storm. So as um, the baby boomers are hitting that age wave that where they're getting to the point where they need some assistance, um, the system has become overwhelmed. Uh, we have a shortage of staffing as well. So uh, facilities are struggling with find, finding staff that can come in and start to work in those areas. Um, one area that I think is positive but has added to some of the, the concerns is that we have a, uh, of a, a consumer now that is far more uh, aware of, of things. So they can go to the internet, social media, they can talk to people and they can now see uh, things that we were not seeing so they can mm. they can talk to each other they can put it out on Facebook on, on or on, on you know Twitter and those types of things so it's becoming far more uh, the awareness is there um, we also see that there is a lack of regulation in some areas um, the assisted living as an example in Minnesota or also known as housing with services um, has two pieces to it and it gets to be confusing and so when family members are thinking that they're placing them in a, in a, uh, a place that um, provides services, they may not be mm. providing services. Mm. And in other cases, they sign a, a contract with these, uh, these assisted living facilities and they realize that the services they think they're going to receive are not necessarily the services that they are receiving. So, so it's a very complex, it's a very confusing uh, industry, and as a result of that, we're starting to see uh, some problems. I think where the shortage of staff uh, as an issue um, is coming up is where you may have one or two staff working in an assisted living at night, mm -hmm. and you may have uh, two or three people that need assistance at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so if someone is not paying attention, uh, someone may fall and get hurt. Uh, as a result of, of the lack of staff as well. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest is Gilbert Acevedo. He's Assistant Commissioner for the Health Systems Bureau at the Minnesota Department of Health, and he's responsible for the Health Policy Division, the Health Partnership Division, Health Regulation Division, and the Office of Medical Cannabis. I want to bring in another voice here. Resma Nakam is a, a friend and, and a, uh, I call him a young elder <laughs> in the uh, black community, but certainly uh, an intellectual, uh, a, um, a strategist, a leader. He's an author uh, and uh, a person that served our community. Actually, uh, Resma, uh, MSW, the pedigrees, uh, uh, licensed social worker, SCP. What is SCP? It's a somatic, uh, uh, somatic experience practitioner. Basically, is I'm a trauma therapist that works with the body. And you've appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, and Dr. Phil is an expert yeah. on conflict and violence. You've served as Director of Counseling Services for the Tubman Family Alliance, and you've been behavioral 
Health Director for African American Family Services in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So Resma, when we hear in the news the stories about elder abuse, mm -hmm. you and I, uh, as African Americans, as black people, yeah. have the question, what's happening with our people? Yeah. Are we in the system, first of all? Because yeah. in our community, there's this fear right. uh, and a hesitation yeah. on the one hand, but on the other hand, there are real needs mm -hmm. for care mm -hmm. that prof professionals can and should and do yeah. provide, but we are ambivalent yeah. about are we failing our responsibility to our loved ones yeah. by putting yeah. them in, in yeah. um, assisted living. Yeah. So how do you uh, interpret the stories that you read? Yeah, well, one of the things that I was, I was uh, struck by as, as Brother was talking was this, uh, how he talked about a perfect storm, but I, I think the perfect storm is 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 not just with in terms of providers. I think also there was a perfect storm in terms of the regulatory pieces. Now, you know, one of the questions that I had is how do we get to a place to where there's 2,300 cases in a queue? That is, you know, you know, what what are the resources that either should have been available that weren't available, and then I understand that now that those caseloads have been have been cleared out. But I want to know, is, it, is that just because this brother came in and started cleaning it out? Or has there been an organizational shift that says this is a value that we have and that that value not only is because I'm telling you to do it, but that value is because we don't want to see people hurt, killed, or maimed, or, and we want our elders to be taken care of. So, so that was one of the things that struck me. The second thing that struck me was that within our community, there is a real, for, for as long as I can remember, I remember having conversations, we ain't putting grandma in no home. Right. You, know, right. I, you know, in our community, that's almost, that has been, you know, now that's changed lately, but it has been, it was an ethic within our family. Well, is she coming to live with you or is she, is she staying with me? We need to start figuring this out because she can't stay on her own much longer, right? And I think that has begun to shift, but I also think that this idea that people are not going to take care of black bodies because there has been a history of, of this society not taking care of black bodies, not valuing black bodies, not even seeing black bodies as human. So if that's the case between able black bodies, the question that happens within the black community, I think, is then what does that mean with black bodies that are not as able? Who has access to them, and how do we be, how do we make sure that grandma, grandpa, uncle, or somebody who's not even, you know, a, a blood relative but a kinship relative, how do we make sure that there is an eye to not only what is happening to them, but there is an eye to understanding how the system works on black bodies and Latino bodies and Native bodies, and not just look at it as okay. Every time, you know, if we if we do decide to put grandma or an elder into a, a community, that we must also consider the system's response to those particular bodies. And I don't think that I think that is an important uh, discussion to have. And I think in our community, if we are starting to move in that path, we have to ask those questions. We can't be put off if I go to put my Latino mother into. A, uh, into an elder care home as if that does not matter because we know it does matter. That, that the fact that she's Latino, the fact that she's black, that, that it matters in terms of her care and we should not be afraid to ask those questions. I'm Al McFarland, this is Conversations with Al McFarland. Resmond, you're gonna join us again a little later, but all this discussion goes to the question of abuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, this next segments of the show are gonna delve into specific arenas of abuse that mm -hmm. I think uh, the society, the times, uh, call us to pay attention to. And uh, one of the persons that helped me organize this show is my friend Tasha Jackson. She's an advocate for represent, advocate representative for people who, uh, you know, struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tasha, uh, you and I talked about the need to bring light mm -hmm. to um, violence, victimization, danger that women face, and black women in particular. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna have several conversations in the next segments uh, talking about uh, the public response to supporting and uh, preventing violence against women, uh, to organizations that uh, are advocates, mm -hmm. and people who've got stories to tell. 
Uh, Gilbert, thank you for being here. Thank you for your leadership and your service. Uh, we want to pay attention. How would you advise consumers to focus and to voice expectations that move the state and the county and providers to the place we all want them to be? What do we do? Right. I, I would say stay involved, mm -hmm. stay engaged, um, hold uh, facilities and the state accountable, mm -hmm. um, engage with uh, your local representatives, legislators, and uh, really pay attention to this because this impacts our community mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. And um, there's nothing worse and, uh, and really heart-wrenching that our, our elders are being uh, hurt mm -hmm. out there at a time when we should be, you know, really celebrating their, their life. Tasha, when it comes to women, what do you want our community to know? <clears throat> I think that it's uh, very important that uh, we need more resources out here to help um, women that are in trouble, that deal with abuse and things like that. We also need more resources as far as the struggles that people face with the system and the government, because you do go through issues dealing with that too. So I, I, I believe that more resources is uh, the key, you know, and, and engaging and getting connected with people that are willing to put more resources out there and listen to people when they call in and say, hey, you know, we have a problem here, we have an issue here, and we, this needs to be handled. Everybody needs to get on board and let's, 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 get, to, let's get to working. Right. and make something happen. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. We'll be back in a minute. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay, cool. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Preacher, money, tell me, great God come from the sky. Make everybody divide to each other, make all the kids get high. It's not home, but it's worth it. All that it glitters is not gold. Now you see the light. You gotta stand up for your right, yeah. Get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Don't give up the fight. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. We're talking about abuse in our community. It's a problem that's gaining uh, more currency, more awareness. Social media allows us to be more aware than we have been before. And our societies, our communities, our state and our counties have organized to address the concerns of residents, of families. I'm pleased to have for this panel uh, Amanda Kunjbahari. She's the manager of Hennepin County's No Wrong Door Initiative. The initiative aims to remove shame and blame from the way the county interacts with youth who have been or are at risk of being sexually exploited. Also joining us, Deborah Huskins. She's the uh, Human Services Area Director of Eligibility, Work Services, and Child Support at Hennepin County. And Jillian Kyles is the Program Manager of Navigation and Information Services at the county, specializing in reaching out and connecting to immigrant families and others as well. So, you know, the issue right now is trafficking. I, I wanted to ask you who are professionals and working for our county to talk about uh, the prevalence of trafficking in our community. We don't talk enough about it. I think the Super Bowl was great in part because it made us be aware that uh, trafficking is uh, an underground activity that's going on everywhere. Uh, Angela, Ama Amanda, excuse Hi. me, Amanda, uh, talk about Super Bowl in particular. What did you guys do at the high level to yeah. bring awareness and to do prevention 
about trafficking. Yep, absolutely. Well, I just want to say first, thank you so much for having us on the show to talk about such an important issue. And in regards to Super Bowl in particular, I think the first thing to highlight is that this issue, as you mentioned, happens 365 days a year. And that was a really key message for us in our organizing and planning. But what we did, so Hennepin County, Ramsey County Attorney's Office, and the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, we came together and convened a committee of folks starting in July of 2016. So we had started our efforts well in advance of Super Bowl. And we brought together a group of people. It grew over time. We ended up having about 80 plus people a part of the or the committee, mm -hmm. uh, 40 plus organizations that spanned all the way from survivors who've been in the life um, to nonprofits, businesses, government entities, and philanthropic organizations. And we broke down our work into seven different subcommittees. So one of them was around business partners. How do we engage the private community in helping us to fundraise and bring awareness to the issue? We looked at training. How do we train the public? How do we develop resources that are needed? Um, we looked at service delivery. And I know some other folks will talk about that later as well. But how do we ensure that street outreach is happening during those 10 days and that the available services are there and housing resources as well? Um, we looked at child protection as one issue, so wanting to coordinate efforts on a statewide um, kind of framework. So DHS kind of ran that and involved different counties within Minnesota because it impacts all of them. We also engage our government partners to do some communications because they have a broad audience that they hit. And then we also engage with our faith-based communities. So wanting, yeah. Let, let's do, do trafficking 101. Okay. <laughs> let's state some definitions. What is the prevalence of the problem in our community in Hennepin County or the metro area? And when we say trafficking, what do we really mean? What are we talking about? Is it kids? Is it adults? Is it men? Is it women? Is it all of the above? Uh, is it the um, um, self-directed activity of individuals who want to be in the sex trade? Or is it a question of, as trafficking suggests, people being forced uh, into a modern day slavery? What is trafficking? Yeah, and please jump in at any time. Yeah. Um, I would say it's everything that you just talked mm -hmm. about. So it is children, men, boys, or girls, boys, um, LGBTQ youth, it is adults as well. Um, so it doesn't discriminate in that sense. I would say what we see in Hennepin County is that it's typically youth who have a lot of vulnerabilities and people are exploiting those things. So youth who may be living in poverty, who may be experiencing homelessness, um, other types of adversity. Maybe they've been sexually abused um, as children as well. And those things made for extra vulnerabilities that other people have exploited. Um, so that's what we're looking at in terms of exploitation. There is typically an exchange. Trafficking in particular is where there's a third party individual involved. So a trafficker, a pimp. Um, who's profiting off of that. And I would say in most cases, we typically see that those vulnerabilities have led somebody to be in the life, as they call it. Um, and so that sense of choice, I think that's a complicated question to, to ask and to really kind of dig into as well. Um, but what we are seeing is that typically there are other factors that have led somebody into the life. Join in, if you would. Okay. Um, we serve so many people in Hennepin County, and I think we don't know the extent of trafficking. Trafficking, we do know it's going on, but we don't know every last person who is experiencing um, this this behavior. Um, but we do have a lot of services that are available for people if they want to reach out. Um, so, for example, if there's um, a person who needs assistance of any kind, wants to move somewhere to a different house or a different um, area of the, of the county and perhaps get some, um, not only get set up in their own living situation, for, but also um, to be able to um, avoid being with a perpetrator, for example, or a, a pimp if they can get away from the person. Um, we do have assistance available and a whole variety of kinds of assistance. Th these kinds of assistance are most often for very low income people um, and there's a lot of government bureaucracy as you might imagine and, and uh, requirements that we have to um, ask people for verification of information. But we do have a lot of resources. And Who's in the life? Is it black women? Is it white women? Is it uh, 
Asian, Latino immigrant families? Uh, is the Somali community affected by this process? What's the picture, what's the profile of people who are experiencing being trafficked mm -hmm. here in Minnesota? Yeah. Or do you want to? You, you can take this one. Okay. I, I, because I think it's, I think it's widespread. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are some communities that are uh, newer communities that may not be as, um, as exposed yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I certainly think it's widespread. I don't think there's any community that's exempt from it. I don't, but I don't know, Amanda, you might have more statistics than I. Yeah. I have a more of a sense of it, I think, rather than hard facts. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's I, your sense? Tell me your sense. Yeah. <clears throat> My sense is that it's widespread and that it's all communities, all genders. I think it's all mm -hmm. age groups. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's all drivers. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things, um, just in terms of sort of how we respond or how we collect information is that a lot of the services that we have available are voluntary services mm -hmm. and they're based on establishing a trust level between um, who comes to us and, and requests assistance and whether or not they trust whether or not um, we have assistance to, to provide them or whether they trust us as individuals. And I think um, there are pockets of places that they can go for that, um, for those services, but being that they're voluntary, sometimes that trust level is really hard uh, to come by. The, the Domestic Abuse Service Center is one where um, they have that opportunity. Amanda's project is another one. Mm -hmm. um, but um, your project is relatively new. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I do think it's hard that trust piece is a big factor in it, big factor. Yeah. Well, a key word I'm reading in your note, uh, Amanda, uh, you want to remove shame and blame. That's mm -hmm. got to be a critical factor. Absolutely. Because uh, yeah. that determines how the right. person sees himself or herself, right. yep. whether he is the or she is the reason mm -hmm. for the condition Absolutely. that they might be experiencing now. Mm -hmm. Blame, accepting that, yeah. and that probably is not a productive uh, uh, way to, to move out of it or beyond it. It's very no. understandable, yeah. though. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's very understandable, as Deborah is saying. We put a lot of shame out there, right, as a society. Mm -hmm. um, and we really want to ensure that people know that they're valued and that they have intrinsic worth um, and that they shouldn't feel blame or shame for uh, situations that have happened. Those things don't define them, right? So, so if we're dealing with providing support and services for individuals who have been victims mm -hmm. of um, uh, sexual exploitation or trafficking, what are we doing to address those who are the victimizers? How is our mm -hmm. society um, uh, addressing that, at least locally? So I'll say a couple of things. Um, at the county level, we were able to get a dedicated prosecutor uh, in the county attorney's office. So um, right now with law enforcement, a lot of the partners that we have who are doing that work, they are doing a lot of demand suppression, so going after the demand. Mm -hmm. um, and typically what we see, it's in Minnesota, it's typically middle-aged white men who may be married or may have children of their own who are perpetrators and are buying sex. Um, so knowing that profile is helpful and law enforcement is very savvy and creative in the ways that they go about mm -hmm. um, trying to do that demand suppression. Mm -hmm. And then we have on the criminal justice side um, experts who are trying to ensure that they then are getting uh, penalties for engaging in that behavior. Okay. Yeah. How, how are we uh, failing to support those who have been exploited? What ought we be doing that we're not? what more needs to be done. And failing is too strong a word probably, because I know that the intent is to provide the best services, but from inside, you probably have frustration that you mm -hmm. wanna do more. What kinds of things do we need to do? Yeah. And then to, to sort of wrap that up, what do you want your neighbors, our neighbors, our families, our communities to know and do? What's the call to action to ordinary residents of our community so that we can support quality of life? Mm -hmm and healing for individuals. Mm -hmm. What yeah. I would say in terms of reporting that if they if they if anybody notices something that makes them think, you know, this doesn't look like a, the right situation there mm -hmm. um, they see somebody dominating another person or a, per, a person who's unwilling to or, or afraid to even speak up at a restaurant or you know just out mm -hmm out and about, they should speak up. They should call law enforcement, I would assume, would be the first place to report. But don't stay silent. Mm -hmm. 
So for me, I think that um, one of the challenges, and it's, it's not just this population, but because we're talking about this population, is the lack of program support. I mean, there's so many needs. There's housing, there's mental health services, there's, you know, there's child care, there's financial. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And I think that um, if it were me, we would have those program supports in place because you can get someone to sort of, if you will, come, come forward or come out of the dark, but then keeping them out is, means giving them the supports that they need to stay out and to be self-reliant and to, to recognize the no shame, the no blame, and to keep moving forward. And so without those community supports, without housing, without the opportunity to be successful, um, it, it's, you're not going to be successful or it's going to be just that much more challenging. So I think having those sort of internal supports, and that's sometimes difficult for us in county government because we've got other groups that are also competing for those types of housing and funds and, and mm -hmm. uh, programs as well. So, so But is, is the Me Too movement creating a, an awareness in the nation and in the community that uh, makes us look differently at our response and responsibility? Um, you know, as you said, there's competition for resources, but should there be? And should the priority be on creating and guaranteeing, assuring quality of life, safety for people that have been victimized, the people that might be victimized in the future? Is there a need for changing something that operates in the culture so that we don't have this yeah. progression of, uh, mm -hmm. of problems? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to go back, I think this feeds into the other question that you asked about how what can people do as mm -hmm. well. Um, this issue is an issue that is resulting from other deeper issues that we have, deep systemic issues around racism, sexism, ageism, right? Um, Me Too is on the fringes of those issues and those systemic issues as well. So I think we all have a responsibility. Um, to start looking at, you know, we as a culture, how do we address toxic masculinity, right? How do we address sexism? How do we address racism? Mm -hmm. Going back to a question you asked earlier about who is being victimized, it is typically youth of color, right, and indigenous youth, and we have to be very real about that um, and, and how we're addressing it as a county, what's our responsibility, but as a society. We all play a role in how we address racial disparities and how we address sexism and how those things manifest and, and create these bigger problems that we have. Okay. Uh, last words for our, our listeners and our viewers. Uh, what do you want, uh, what instruction do you give them so that their voices and their concerns uh, can be part of the solution side of this equation? Well, um, I'll speak more as a citizen than as a Hennepin County um, employee at this point because um, I live in Washington County and Washington County has a very active citizen group that has grown up and is working with the county attorney's office but citizens decided they wanted to get engaged and to prevent this. Um, so that's an example people could look to and either create their own or join another mm -hmm. community organization that's trying to raise aware awareness, get information out. And I, I would say the the question about both um, the people who, the demand side, which is where I think the, the Me Too movement really mm -hmm. um, is getting at, let's not make this behavior okay anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. And then, then what do we need as services? Um, I would look to your next guests. Mm -hmm. Right, Breaking free, I think, will give you mm -hmm. the, the great answers. Well, here, there. Here's another question I'll have. It's a difficult question. I've often said that in uh, many cases, uh, our governments, could be county, city, state, uh, support uh, white organizations addressing so-called issues within communities of color. My shorthand is that we get the problem, they get the money. Mm -hmm. We get the misery, they get the money. In effect, our misery becomes a, a pool for revenue. How do we, number one, make that skepticism go away? Because uh, maybe it's not right. But what I've heard in talking to my friend Tasha Jackson uh, before was there's a need to enable organizations and individuals within communities of color mm -hmm. to support and to bring forth resolutions. And so mm -hmm. up to now, there has been an unwillingness to either agree or to believe that uh, the victims can be the solutions to the problem. What do you think about that? Is there, is there a basis for that feeling 
Uh, Jillian, what do you think? Well, of course, call on me. Um, <laughs> um, is, there, is there a basis yeah. in the community for that feeling? Yeah. Yes. Is there a basis in the county? How does the county react to, to guys like Al McFarland questioning whether or not the county is being well, truly, genuinely responsive and inclusive? And you know, my deal is follow the money. Is, is the money flowing to the victims and, and not just to people who are, you know, I don't want to oversimplify because I don't want to disparage anybody whose serious intent is to be a, a public servant. Well, I, but, I don't think I have that answer because I don't think I function at that level to mm -hmm. be able to know where the money flows. Mm -hmm. But but I do know that um, we every every person in the county has an elected official, mm -hmm. and they're your elected officials. They're our elected officials. I live in Hennepin County. They're my elected official. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel as though your community is being represented, whether it's your community, my community, that's where you go. It's your elected official. And if there, I mean, one, one voice becomes a movement if the right number of voices are attached to it and it's the right issue. So I would say that's get where up, you start. Get up, stand get up. up. Sta get up, stand up. That's where you start. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al. We're out of time. Okay. <laughs> but it, go, it goes so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Last comment, Amanda? I was just going to say, um, we as a county, we have we do have to look in the mirror too and do better at that. Mm -hmm. And I think we're trying to do that. I'm mm -hmm. going to speak for myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, engaging, we need to be partners with the community from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, we've had this it's developed, right? I came on when it was developed, mm -hmm. but looking at how do we form advisory boards with youth as an example, where mm -hmm. we pay them and we actually look to them to kind of guide us in this work because they're the experts, right? Mm -hmm. um, so seeing more things like that, I think would be really great to have, yeah. Thank you all so very much. Uh, my thanks to Amanda Kujbahari, she's manager of Hennepin County's No Wrong Door Initiative. Thanks to Deborah Huskins, Human Services Area Director of Eligibility Work Services and Child Support at the county. And thanks to you, Jillian Kyles, for your work as a program manager of Navigation and Information Services at Hennepin County. We're gonna continue talking about the question of violence, exploitation, about trafficking. Stay tuned. To all the women in the world You must take back the night Yes, from my little girl She will take back the night No fear No worry No bullying for me Tell the truth when it comes to you. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. We've been looking at the question of abuse, uh, abuse in our community, and one of the areas that's most egregious is the area of trafficking. Terry Forliti is the executive director of Breaking Free. Breaking Free is committed to the diversity and to the empowerment of women by helping them get out of prostitution and sex trafficking. Celia Viel, Viel, I may be saying it the wrong way, uh, is executive director of an organization called Start Anew uh, and facilitator of a project called It's Okay to Be You. She's working with women who have legal history that uh, may create a barrier to housing and employment. Tonique Eiler uh, is the housing advocate of Breaking Free. Uh, Tonique and I met some while ago when she was presenting at a conference out at, I think, the University uh, of Minnesota. But her testimony was powerful, uh, compelling, and I've invited her to be on this show on the radio, but back for television because I so um, believe uh, the power of your testimony. And I've talked to people about this as a person who I think has a calling on their life. And the calling is one that will help heal uh, individuals and help our community find healing as well. But I wanna begin by asking Terry Forlidi to take a minute to give us 
a primer. When we talk about prostitution and sex trafficking, you know, these are academic terms almost, but there's a place where it's real. And, and you can tell us about that. What does it mean in Minnesota? Yeah, Al, it's very real. Um, one of the things we just went through, of course, uh, was the Super Bowl. And there was a lot of talk as to, is there an uptick? Is there not an uptick? What's going to happen during the Super Bowl? And um, it played out the way we thought it was going to play out. There was a slight uptick. We know there was about um, 94 men arrested. 90 of them were from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So this is something that happens every day. And we could continue to arrest 90 men every day if there was political will and resources to do that. Um, at Breaking Free, we're one of the service providers. We're not safe harbor, so we provide services for adult women. And we have one of the largest service provider agencies in the United States, being that we have three 18-unit apartment buildings to provide women and their children getting out of the life. Um, and isn't that sad that we're one of the biggest with 48 families in the United States? They, there should be other models all over the United States. And when we say permanent housing, we mean permanent. Because, oh, many of us had pre-existing conditions or maybe a congenital anomaly. We might have had FAS syndrome. We might be autistic. Fetal alcohol syndrome. Yeah, mm -hmm. fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm -hmm. We may be autistic. We may have um, some vulnerability that led us into the life in the first place. Um, mine was I was raped when I was 15 years old by my boss, who was 28. And at that time, he was dating Miss Minnesota, Sheila Bernhagen. Who was going to believe anyone? that I was raped by this man when he was dating this beautiful woman. So that was a seed that was planted within me. Now, um, so we know abuse and exploitation happens when, when you have a vulnerability and an unmet need, and then somebody comes along with a false promise, and that creates the perfect storm. Just to give you an idea, in Minnesota alone, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, we see 350 new people women every year, and those are adults. The average woman and or girl, I would say, in the United States, and especially in Minnesota, turns between five and 10 tricks a day. That means you service whomever is there five to 10 times. It could be other women, it could be men, it could be animals, it could be fetish, it could be whatever. But this is a reality, Al, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, during the Super Bowl, we were able to remain open for 24 hours a day for the 10 days leading up to the Super Bowl. But the day after, we had to let people leave. There wasn't a shelter. There wasn't anything open. But we do continue to have a drop-in space every day, Monday through Friday, where women can come between 9 and 5, have showers, sleep. But then at the end of the day, there they go. They leave. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that the, um, so it's five to 10 tricks a day is the average number, where in Southeast Asia it could be up to 40. Um, but in Minnesota, the quota would be anywhere between $800 and $1,200 a day. Um, in Chicago, it could be more. In New York, it could be more. Um, and then if we were down south, if we were in Jackson, Mississippi or something, it would be a lot less, of course, because it would go by the, um, by the economy in that city, but this is real, and this is happening um, every day. And uh, we need to really pay attention to what our kids are doing and our youth, and, and it is important that we have safe harbor in place, but it's also important to take a look at those of us that are involved in survival sex mm -hmm. and day-to-day -day walking the streets. Even though know, the internet takes care, um, about 80% of the buying and trading is done via some sort of internet or social media, spot, but there's still no street trafficking. Survival sex, what is that? Survival sex would be, for instance, um, if you're not placing an ad on, on Backpage, and, and I'll tell you, some of us, I went to court with a woman last week that was 61 years old. So many of us age out of social media. So somebody my age at 56 years old, I'm not going to place an ad on Backpage if I was still in the life. But I still have to come up with that money at the end of the day for my perpetrator. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the street because I can pick up a trick fast on the street. Um, other folks you see on the street, large Native American population, LBGTQ, 
A lot of our folks that uh, identify as LBGTQ don't want to post on Facebook or uh, social media because we know that they are treated with um, ill fate and we don't want to give, they don't want perpetrators to have that time to see their picture and plan what's going to be done with them. It's easier to just hop in a car and whatnot. Some people um, have might just need diapers, food, something to feed their children. Maybe we just got out of prison. Maybe we a lot just. Of the women, they need um, a place to stay that yeah, night or to somewhere to wash their clothes, mm -hmm. um, maybe somewhere to get a hot meal, and they don't know about breaking free. Mm -hmm. So that part, it really breaks my heart. I don't know how many clients that I talk to where they tell me they just had to sleep with someone just so they had somewhere to sleep, but it's not even a safe place because you still have to worry about that person coming to grope you throughout the night and you having to fulfill their needs just to be there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Tony, tell your story uh, to the degree that you're comfortable telling it. Mm -hmm. um, well, how mine went was more so it's called intergenerational prostitution. And that was because my, my father was a pimp and I had three stepmoms. Um, my dad is what he called them ladies of the night. I, I grown to learn that they were prostituted women. Even though my dad treated me like a princess, um, he still planted that seed in me at a very young age of how women are supposed to be obedient and submissive to a man. I remember at times one of my stepmoms um, got out of pocket with him. Or out of pocket means like just um, disrespectful in his eyes. I remember him taking a pot of boiling hot water and rice and pouring it on her back. This was when I was 15 and I'm 37 now and I still have the mental image of her flopping to the floor in agony. I remember him punching another woman in the face so hard that she fell into the tub and he would just simply close the door and just say it's out of order. So that's what I grew up with was a lot, seeing a lot of, um, of uh, like rage and violence in the home. It was a lot different from my mother's home. My mother was a survivor of domestic abuse. She worked hard. Um, I, like Terry, I was raped at 14 years old. I was very angry, um, I was very angry. I didn't know how to express my emotions. I didn't know how to articulate my words. My mom tried a lot to get me into counseling and, and help me, but I just still kept butting heads with her until she allowed me to live with my dad. Um, and then as I got older, when I did meet my trafficker, that time my life was very, very, I knew that my life had changed forever. Um, I remember how he tried to swooze me into it, telling me that I would be an escort and I would go on fancy uh, dinners and dates with these men. And when I went on my first one, um, we went out to dinner and we went back to his condo. When sex was initiated and I declined, the man brought me back home. When I got home, I remember handing the money over to my trafficker and he hit me so hard that I spun in a 360 and I hit the floor. Uh, he yelled at me to get up or he would uh, kick me in the stomach. Apparently, I didn't move fast enough because he kicked me so hard that I peed on myself before I could stand. I remember him yelling at me, telling me I have the obligation, I have the obligation to, for, for, for me to pretty much sell myself. You know, I, have, I give conversation with the obligation to buy. That was his exact words. At that moment, I knew that my life would never be the same. Um, he shipped me out of town a lot because um, one thing that traffickers do try to do is take you away from your support system. He didn't want me to be able to reach out to my mom or reach out to my brother, so he sent me to Nevada where I knew no one. Uh, he was very close uh, with the lady who ran the brothel that I worked at, so I was still constantly always watched. Uh, when I would come back to Minnesota, I was still followed and watched. And in your family, of it, you have your trafficker, you have the bottom lady, and then you have your wife-in-laws. Even though they're supposed to be close-knit with you, you're still always in competition with them no matter what. Um, I remember at one point, two of my wife-in-laws were arguing and we had to have a family meeting. He brought all of us down to the basement and he stripped two of the girls, handcuffed them together, sprayed them with water, and whooped them with metal hangers. Their welts were as large as like, as long as my hands, and they had lacerations on them. Um, back then, there was no going to the doctors. There's no going to the hospitals. You can't do that. We, so I was the oldest, so I had to play nurse, and you had to go right back to work. So just by seeing him do that to other women, I just I felt stuck, and I knew I had to be loyal. Um, at one point, when I did finally was able to get away from him, when I was in Nevada, and I ended up leaving the brothel. I lied and said I was going somewhere else up to Burger King. 
I remember hitching rides with truck drivers coming back. Um, at one point, um, when I was, I stayed in hotels for a while, and I did have an addiction. You I came did. Came back to Minnesota. Yes, mm -hmm. I came back to Minnesota, um, and I did have an addiction. I didn't know how to deal with my pain or my emotions, so I numbed them a lot. Um, I was catching a bus going to my mom's house. Uh, I remember hearing a car screeching coming behind me to a halt, and I turned around. It was my trafficker coming out. I remember him swinging a bat at me. I jolted back, and when I turned to run, I took one step, and everything went black. Uh, when I woke up, there was a gas station attendants and people over me asking me if I was okay. I blacked back out again. When I woke up again, that's when I was in the hospital, and they were putting staples in the back of my head. And it was from him hitting me with a bat, and he began kicking me and yelling obscenities at me until the gas station attendant called the police. When I was in the hospital, I wasn't going to tell on him. It's still that, um, what's the correct term for it? Trauma bond? Trauma bond. Trauma bond with, yeah, trauma bond relationship. Although he still did all those horrible things to me, I still wasn't going to tell on him. And if he did this for me, just for me, like, did that to me, for me, like, just for leaving, imagine what he's going to do if I tell on him. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's a very hard lifestyle to leave. Um, when you do leave, you have a lot of barriers. You have your kids to take care of. Um, you could lack education. Um, I always felt like I had something on my forehead where everybody knew what I was doing at all the time. Um, I had that, that scarlet shame. letter yes, syndrome. And, and I had that shame inside. Um, so I figured at one point, you know, I'll just I'll sell drugs instead. So this way I don't have to sleep with as many people when I left them again. And on well, by the grace of God, I had three control buys done on me. Uh, I was running around with five felony warrants. Um, when the police finally did catch up to me, I had to go to jail. And jail was a bittersweet blessing for me because that's where I finally learned how to love myself, how to love me for all my flaws. Um, I had a lot of faith-based uh, communities that came into the church to talk to us. They helped me fill my void and my emptiness with the Lord. Um, and then I signed up for boot camp, which is known as the Challenge Incarceration Program. That's where I actually learned accountability because I really lacked that. Um, integrity because I was always forced to lie about something and I really got to get to know myself and one of the biggest things I learned was teamwork because being in the lifestyle you're always in competition with the other women it's very hard to trust other people so teamwork was a really big one that I struggled with a lot um, I actually I earned um, an early release I wasn't even supposed to be released from prison until 2020 and I got out in 2016 um, I remember sitting in the hole reading a book called Breaking Free uh, or reading a book called Walking Prey, and in it the woman talked about breaking free. Uh, when I was released from prison, my case manager told me about breaking free because I told her my goal was to, I wanted to be a women's advocate, and I want to help other women get out of sex trafficking who went through the same things I went through. Um, when I was released from prison, I had to go to resource for treatment, and breaking free did classes there. And now it's the, the class was called Sisters of Survival, and it's actually the class that I teach now. It's a 14-week intense mm -hmm. study of sex trafficking as a slave-based system, the impact it has on victims' lives, issues to dealing with addiction and recovery. We work a lot on boundaries because a lot of our women lack that. And we work a lot with communication because so many of our women had to be passive all the time. So we teach them to be assertive, to stand up for yourself, to empower yourself, and be able to speak for yourself. And that's a really big one. That's amazing. What a wonderful <laughs> story. Uh, we're almost out of time, but you know what? Uh, this is just uh, uh, great to hear you. So, Celia, yeah, you, know, you bring an element to this in trying to support women who've got a legal situation in get, getting housing. So that's part of the problem is access, right? So how do you do that? What do you do? And what needs to be done? What does the public need to, do, need to do to support your organization and women who need this help? Well, start anew, we have like it's okay to be you the group you're referring to and it's an empowerment group mm -hmm. for women and it helps them to become empowered so that like she said that they can get away from those movies that are playing in their head like you're not worth anything or you got to be where you're at but people do need housing they need the basics we need to have a place to stay we need to have a job definitely we just need to be able to um become I don't know if I want to use the word citizens, but I mean, we want to be involved in the community and we want to be treated just like everybody else is treated. We made mistakes, we paid for our mistakes, and 
it's not necessary to pay for them for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So um, the community does need to be aware. And then it also depends on what, what's your community because um, I live over north. There's a lot of people, so they say, that have criminal history. I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But um, how would you want me to come back home? If I were to go to prison, how do you want me to come back home? Because if I cannot take care of my kids, if I don't have a place to stay, if I cannot be part of society, then, of course, I'm going to go back to doing what I did do. I would be back in survival mode so I could survive. And everybody wants to survive. That's right. Listen, we're out of time, but I want to thank all of you for the work you do, for the testimony you provide, for the leadership and the service that you do. Uh, Tony, thank you for your story. Keep telling the truth. Uh, keep inspiring and keep demonstrating that uh, hope uh, and redemption, fulfillment is possible. It's real and that we all can have it. Uh, Celia, thank you for your advocacy, your fierceness uh, in explaining uh, the challenges people uh, are experiencing and that our society, our neighborhood, our families have an obligation and a duty to do something to support uh, sisters and brothers who need to come back home and have a home. And uh, Terry, thank you so much for your leadership at Breaking Free for uh, supporting this notion that women uh, must be empowered to sort of reclaim their time, as Sister Maxine Waters would say, to reclaim their space of leadership and service to our community and to prevent uh, themselves from uh, uh, a life of victimization, often uh, believing that they're responsible for it when our society creates this matrix that gives you no choice but to make that choice. Well, I wanna thank all of you. Thank you so very much. We'll let people know how to connect with you to support what you're doing, but your work is important, and I thank you so much. I thank you. Thank you. I'm thank Al you. McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Well, if you fall down, I'll be there. If you're wondering, I do care. If you think about the world as it is, can't you say? You are the one that makes the sun shine, woman. You are the one that keeps the man in right places, woman. There's no better power than you and your eyes, woman, for me. You are the one that makes the sun shine. was not for you, what would I be to? I'd be with this woman, or whoever loves you. The power of a woman, I'm here for you. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. I'm just a cowboy, I'm gonna come into your town. Every time I see you, you make my heart go wild. Every time you kiss me, you make me want to smile. It's all right, it's okay. I wanna be that special lover. Wanna be your cowboy, please?